Ever since ChatGPT was released, innovative faculty and students have been trying to figure out the rules for using generative AI in the classroom. Now, so far, I have found six essential rules to keep in mind when using generative AI in the classroom. Hi, I'm Prof C, and I talk about generative AI and its impact on education, business, jobs, and society. And today, I want to share my classroom rules for using generative AI. Number one, never ask a generative AI something you don't already know the answer to. Remember, generative AI systems such as ChatGPT are statistical models and not the same as a search engine or a trusted expert. You can't trust anything an AI writes or produces, or at least not at this point. Some pro tips. Ask it for references. You might, if you're using Google Bard, click the double check response button on BARD. Try multiple systems. Ask your same query under BARD, ChatGPT, and Claude. One, if one system comes up with something unusual compared to the other two, that might indicate a hallucination. Number two, minimal prompts produce minimal results. Google search has trained us to make concise queries. Generative AI works best with longer prompts that provide context and details on the final product you want generated. Keep on refining and then refining and then do some more refining of your prompts to get the answer or the output that you want. Number three, AI detectors are worthless and should not be used. There are many ways to get around existing detectors and in the long run, AI-generated text will be indistinguishable from human-generated text. Instead, as a faculty member, you should teach your students how to use these new tools. For example, I'll link to an exercise down below from Mart Watkins that encourages students to use Lex.Page as a writing tool to explore generative AI. And Lex.Page will actually truthfully label what is generated by an AI and what is generated by the student. And it helps the students see how they're progressing and how they're using that system rather than just using it to create blobs of text that they can copy and paste in. Number four, use multiple systems, not just to identify outliers that might be hallucinations, but also to explore different approaches and responses. It's fine to have a preferred AI for a week or maybe even a month, but things are changing so fast, you have to be constantly reevaluating which is going to be the best tool for you and your work. Number five, this is very important learn to reference how you are using generative AI in your work. Now, I require my students to provide an endnote on how they use the AI what AI they used, the dates and the versions, but I also require some information on the prompts the students used, how they refined the results and the process they used. Was this a brainstorming tool? Was it used to simulate what a reader would do with this material, uh, simulate a particular person in a scenario? While the APA style guide for AI treats generative AI or ChatGPT like a source, and I'll link to that below, it's the wrong approach. These systems can do so much more than produce a blob of text. And if you are using just the first blob of text that you get, you are not taking full advantage of these tools. See above, minimal prompts produce minimal results. Number six, finally, the version of generative AI that you are using today is only going to improve. Keep that in mind. These tools are not static, and a tool that doesn't work for you today may work brilliantly tomorrow. Now I'm going to ask you, things are developing. It's the Wild West out there. What additions, deletions, or suggestions do you have for my list? Please comment below. And once again, if you've made it to the end of one of my videos, you're part of an elite crowd, and you should definitely subscribe.